Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship on this Trinity Sunday, first Sunday after Pentecost and Memorial Weekend. It is a pleasure to be here with you in worship this morning for those of you who are here in person and a warm welcome to all of those who are joining us online this morning. Just have a couple of announcements uh, before we begin today's service, and that is a note that the office will be closed tomorrow for Memorial Day. And then the week of June 3rd through 6th, our secretary, Sarah, will be gone. And so please, if you want or need to reach the office that week, uh, email me directly or call my cell phone. That'll be the easiest way to reach the church office. That's the week of June 3rd through 6th. There is no session this Tuesday, so if you are on session, you have a month off. We will resume in June. And uh, happy Memorial Day to all of you who are here this weekend. We have many who are traveling, so we will be sure to remember them in our prayers later. Any other announcements for this morning? Oh, yes, we've got a clipboard in the back. Is this... Thank you. There's a clipboard in the back for fellowship this morning, if you would be interested in hosting, we sure would appreciate it. And a big thank you to Jacinth and Bill, who um, are very faithful in picking up those days and weeks in which we have no one else who is serving. We sure appreciate the work that you do. Was that the same? Very good. All right, with no other announcements, let us come into, oh, there is another announcement. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, the stained glass that was made in honor of Dick Newman uh, is up this morning for our Memorial Weekend celebration. Thank you. Let us now come into our time of worship. A quick word on our lectionary calendar as we begin worship this morning. I did mention it was Trinity Sunday. This is one of those very looked over holidays in the church calendar. Most of us could do, do without it for the most part. I do want to say that we are going to continue our sermon series I've been meaning to ask this Sunday and next Sunday. And then we'll be actually revisiting the idea of Trinity in three weeks during that service. So 
Though it's usually skipped over, this week we're just, or this year we're just skipping it forward a couple of weeks. As we call ourselves to worship this day, we remember that we are a group of people who are, are called by God. And it is in our response to God's call that we gather. We come as a people with diverse backgrounds and from different places and from different spaces in our lives. And yet in this time, in this one hour, we are one. We are one body of Christian believers. Let us call ourselves to worship. Family of faith, this is the place for connection and growth. This is the place for community and hope. This is the place where all belong. All are welcome here. All hurts and joys, needs and prayers, dreams and love are welcome here. God is near. Let us worship our holy God. Let us join together in our first hymn, number 35. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able. today's call to confession. How many of you have ever had a bad day and found someone offering you unsolicited advice? How many of you have ever had a bad week and then someone rushes in with dozens of suggestions on how you can fix things as though you hadn't thought of that before? We have all been there and we have all done that. It is part of our humanity. Our scripture today reminds us that often in the face of hurt, what people really need is not a list of advice or solutions, but the simple presence of love. So let us pray to God today, acknowledging that we are works in progress and that relationships always come with mistakes and confession. Gracious God, Sometimes life feels like cooking with flour. It looks like it should be easy, but we always make a mess. This is particularly true when it comes to our relationships. We desperately long to say the right thing, to be the right thing, to find the right solution that we overstep the line. Forgive us for assuming to fill your place. Give us the grace and strength to stand by our loved ones in moments of need 
to witness their hurt without trying to fix it. You are God, we are not. Teach us how to be a friend. Teach us how to ask, what do you need? Teach us how to point to you. Amen. Friends, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. today's prayer of illumination. Holy God, come to us with loud praise and joy, or appear to us in a still, small voice. Come to us through strangers. Come to us in this text and in this hour of worship. We are seeking you. We are always seeking you. With grateful hearts cracked open by love, we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading for this morning comes from 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verses 19, excuse me, 9 through 18. This is a piece that I don't believe is read very often, in particular because it's part of what we would call the personal instructions that Paul gives to others. So what we might call an exhortation in other pieces of his letters, what happens here is that he's just telling people what to do. So, Hear what Paul has to say for us this morning. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demos, in love with this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You must also be aware of him, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May that not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to invite our children up for a time of conversation this morning.
water to wash what I need. Yeah, we need it, right? Like, in order to keep living, at some point, we need to drink some water. Can't live a coffee and chocolate alone. No, perhaps. How about clothing? We need. Also, like a social prerequisite, right? People are thinking we're strange. We want to ask about clothing. But definitely a need. Okay, how about this?
seated. We move from the New Testament to the Old Testament today in our second reading. This comes from the story of Job. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all the troubles that had come upon him, they each set out from their homes, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shutite, Zophar the Namathite, and they met together to go and console and, and comfort Job. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and they wept aloud. They tore their robes and they threw dust in the air upon their heads. And then they sat with him on the ground for seven days and for seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. I'm going to pause this and see if I can get a better volume for you. Todd, did I screw something up here? Are you able to hear that? Yes, no. I apologize, Brent. Let me restart this. It it worked great earlier today before I started touching it. Hi. My name is Brandon, and I am a healthcare chaplain in Austin, Texas. I've been serving at the bedside of the sick and the dying. Any ideas? I'm a Presbyterian pastor, and I'm currently working on a pastor's own. I've been meaning to ask, what do you need? It's a big deal. I know for me, there are many times until I'm asked what I need, I don't stop to think about it. I've been at the hospital with a big family conference, crisis, and this and that. It's not until someone pulls me aside and says, What do you need? And even then, my first response is usually, I need the neurologist. I need the neurologist to show up. Tell me when they're going to be here because I've got 20 people in the waiting room and we need a neurologist to be at the family conference. You want to say, Okay, okay. Yeah, but what else do you need? I'm sorry, Ooh, I need French fries. I need French fries. That's what I need. And then sometimes in those slower moments, the answer is when someone asks me what I need, it's being very existential. Like, I need to know what God wants for me in this life. I need to know that my life has meaning. I need to know that my child's going to grow up healthy and, and, and do good in the world. And I need to know that I'm loved and I'm safe. And, and then I look back and I say, well, I was, I was just going to go to the cafeteria here. Um, I need the fries. Um, but uh, thank you for sharing the rest of that. When we ask people about their needs, it's a really special thing. I would say it's even a sacred thing because it, it, it can connect us into a relationship with one another. Because on both sides of the question, the one asking the question and the one receiving the question, there is intention and consent. So if I'm the one asking, <coughs> what do you need? I'm putting myself in a place where I don't know what you're going to say. Now, of course, I can sort of bracket it. So, hey, I'm running to the kitchen. Uh, do you need anything? And then they can answer. And what I'm telling them is, if there's something in the kitchen, I will grab it for you. If it's not in the kitchen, I'm not getting it. That's not on the table of things that you can tell me that you need. But it can also be a very broad, just tell me what you need. I don't know, so it is an act of faith and curiosity and respect when I offer that to somebody else. Now, as the person who is asked that, I also have a choice. I get to say, yes, 
You know, maybe I can choose to enter into this relationship. I can choose to respond. And then I get to choose a level of vulnerability and the depth and the breadth of how I respond. So, you know, I'm feeling safe and secure and it's someone that I, I know loves me and cares for me and I'm in the right place. I may respond with a whole litany of things. Everything from, these are the things that I need from the kitchen when you go get them, to these are the ex existential desires and longings of my soul. Everything in between. And I think that's the really special part about leaning into one another and offering ourselves to listen. Because sometimes the thing that they want is not found it's not found in the French rice. It's something that can't happen. I can't heal your parent who's been in that bed for two weeks. I can't fix overnight a systemic system that oppresses folks. Um, and so sometimes all I can do is witness the fact that you have this need and I can hear it and I can hold it and be another person who knows. And well, yes, we want the systemic issues with oppression to be wiped away. We want this inner kingdom. We want things to be beautiful and wonderful and safe. We want folks to have health and well-being and all the good things. Sometimes we're just not in a place to be able to do those. But it can't stop us from stepping in with intention and faith to lean in and to connect with one another. What do you need? A question that is indeed a tricky one. One of the things that I was thinking about in the last month or so since I first heard this question is about babies. You see, I think that what babies need tell us a lot about what other people need. What do babies need? They need food. They need sleep. They need shelter. They need their diapers changed. And as I understand it, all four of these needs are pretty cyclical in life. Sometimes we don't need them in the middle stages, but often again in the end. But the funny thing about babies is they have a fifth need. They need to know that they are not alone. They need comfort and companionship. If you've ever been around a baby, you've probably experienced this. You set them down and they cry. And you make sure that they don't need food or sleep or shelter. That they don't need their pants changed, that everything is good that way. And then they still cry. You pick them up and they stop. You put them back down and what do they do? They cry. And you pick them up again. And you pat them a couple of times and you say, oh, you're so sweet and cute. And then you put them back down again. And they cry. They need companionship. It's more than a want for babies. They need it. And funny thing is, we never begrudge a baby that needs companionship in the way we sometimes do in adulthood. We have different needs at every stage in life. The things that we need as infants really aren't all the things that we need in adulthood or in later age. But babies have figured out, before they have a sense of many other things in life, they've figured out that companionship is really integral to our human experience. Children that are raised in isolation. We sometimes hear these stories on the news or in uh, different pieces where they have found a, a child or person who has, uh, for some reason, grown up without companionship. And that there is a piece missing in those people who have 
been deprived of the company of others. Companionship is sometimes couched, as this minister said, in, in the way in which we are vulnerable to each other. And it raises the question, can we ask the question, what do you need? And the key here, I think one of the most important things that she gets at is that when we ask that question, we have to be okay with not being able to fix it. I think one of the primary barriers to asking this question is that somebody might tell us that they need something that we cannot provide. Job's friends here do something really interesting. You see, they may have some less than stellar advice later, especially if you get into the later chapters of Job. I won't say that they are always the best friends, but they do something really important here in chapter two. They find out about Job's incredible tragedies, and they show up. They come from different cities, and they come together to check on their friend to make sure he's all right. And they see and witness Job's sorrow. And so what do they do? They don't say it's going to be okay. They don't say it's all right. They don't say they're there or God's got a plan. They weep and they tear their clothes. They rend their clothes and they throw dirt on their heads, uh, probably because they didn't have any ashes there that they could uh, have access to. And then what do they do? Do you remember what they did? Kids were listening. I know that they were listening. They sit. They go and they sit with Job for seven days and seven nights in silence. This is probably the first time in scripture that we witness what becomes later the Jewish practice of sitting Shiva. That is this period after death when people mourn together in silence. For seven days, they offer witness and companionship. It's this idea of witness that's really important here. They are, through their presence and through their actions, showing Job that they see what he's going through. They really aren't able to understand it, at least in the way that Job is feeling it. They've not had this incredible loss after loss. They have not lost their entire families and their entire wealth and their personal health all at the same time as he has but they witness it. When we think about the question, what do you need? We open up to the other. I think Reverend Remington Johnson does a good job of pointing this out. He says, you know, when we ask this question, we are making ourselves vulnerable. Here in Job, we have this person who has suffered extreme trauma. He has lost his livelihood. He has lost his family. He has lost his future well-being. You see, because how do you live into the future in ancient Israelite society? You live into the future through your children. So not only is his present gone, but so are his future hopes and aspirations. His friends show up and they offer him solidarity, weeping with him, tearing their robes in an outward manifestation that all is not right in the world. And then they sit for days and they bear witness to Job's experiences. And as I said, if you go home and read through the book of Job, you will find that his friends are far from perfect. But aren't we all? It is their presence 
It is them showing up that gives weight and credibility to this horrible suffering. Their presence signifies that this is real, that this is horrible, and that this is impactful. The church, the big C church, not just our church here, but the church in general, we are called to be a community that acts in fellowship, that care about each other outside of the one hour that we sit here on Sundays. And part of that is that we work to witness the experience of others in the world. We do that through our sharing of joys and concerns, but we also do that through our interactions outside of the sanctuary. Sending cards, making phone calls, sending a text, or even stopping by. When we take note of pain, when we recognize the grief and sorrow that someone else is going through, when we're attuned to the suffering of other individuals, it gives it gravity. You see, without a witness, it's hard to feel understood. It's hard to know that others support you. Job's friends can't bring his family back. They can't restore his livelihood or his health. And though they offer some less than helpful suggestions later, their job is really not the job of fixer or repairer. Their job, however, is elemental or fundamental, right? It sits at the base of our human experience. They offer companionship in order that Job knows that he is not alone in his suffering and pain and grief. Asking the question, what do you need, is a risky one, since we don't know what the answer will be, but it's an important one. And if we are brave enough to ask it, I think this question can be a revelation. It's my prayer today that God may give us the courage to ask one another, what do you need? Amen. Hear this morning's invitation to the offering. When we love someone in need, it is easy to give. We show up with casseroles and prayer blankets. We send cards and we make phone calls. We don't think twice about it because when we love someone in need, it is easy to give. In worship, when we give to the offering, what we are also declaring is that not just those that we love are worthy of our gifts. When we give here, we are declaring that all of creation deserves love and care. Today, as a way to practice being in relationship and drawing closer to one another, I invite you to give to the mission and ministry of this church. For when we love, it is easy to give.
join me in our offertory prayer. O oh God, maker and provider, you have blessed us with many gifts. Use us and what we have gathered to feed the world through your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you would please be seated. I have a couple of items for this morning uh, to lift up to you and then would uh, hear what you have brought today for joys and concerns. First is this is a graduation weekend for many schools around the state. We keep all of our high school and college graduates in our thoughts as they um, pass this milestone. Uh, second, uh, prayers as many travel over the Memorial Weekend holiday, including many of our members here who are traveling during this weekend. And uh, prayers this morning, some of you have asked me about my son Jesse and how he is doing. Continued prayers for him, please. He is continuing um, to feel unwell, so he's not been feeling great for a month. So your prayers for him are much appreciated. And this Memorial Day weekend, remember we remember all those who have sacrificed their lives, uh, not just for sake of our country, but for sake of our God and for the liberty that we are given. What joys and concerns do you bring today? Yes, thank you. What a blessing that is. Um, Marlene Tesh, her daughter, has been receiving cancer treatment for some time and was deemed this week to be cancer-free. What a blessing indeed to hear that. Yeah, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Blessing for the time that you were able to spend with family, indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Continued prayers for Jim Casey in the treatment of his eye. Uh, this is a long process for him, and we pray for his healing, but also continued endurance in a long process. We hold many prayers in our hearts that we do not speak aloud, and yet we still bring them to God, knowing that God knows the words of our hearts. Would you join me in our responsive prayer of intercession? God of here and now, this world seems to turn upside down all the time. Our center of gravity feels askew. In moments like these, we are particularly grateful for the care you offer and the stability of the friendships and families that you have cultivated for us. Today, we say a prayer of thanks for the people in our lives who take the time to ask, what do you need? Gracious God, help us to be those people for others. Give us the eyes to see when our neighbors are in need and the wisdom to ask, what do you need? Stop our assumptions cold in their tracks and instead carve out space in us to listen. Help us to practice listening slowly and intentionally. Help us to sit with others in pain and struggle and let us honor it. Gather us in and hold us close be with us in our waiting and in our praying. Be with us in our grief and our sorrow. Be in our relationships that we might be blessed with friends who support us and that we might be people who can bless others. With deep gratitude and with true humility, we pray the words your sons taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join now in our closing hymn number 300. the world this day, knowing that you are a child of God that is dearly loved. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>